السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد و نستعین و نستغفر و نؤمن به و نتوکل علیہ و نعوذ باللہ من شرور انفسنا و من سیئیات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وهل الأغدة من لساني يفقه قولي Ahlan was silent for the next Sira session that we are having. As usual, we will take a small recap on the previous session, session number 35. We started with the martyrdom of Anas ibn al-Nadr, Razalaw ta'ala anhu, Khaytama Abu Saad, and Thabit ibn al-Dahdaha, Razalaw ta'ala anhuma. Then how the Sahaba started defending the Prophet ﷺ. There were only two people with him at the, at the time when he was getting injured. One was Saad ibn Waqqas, Abi Waqqas, and the other was Talha ibn Ubaidullah. Now, the Prophet ﷺ said something to Saad, which he was proud of for the rest of his life. What was it? The phrase was, May my mother and father be given to you in ransom. And Talha ibn Ubaidullah, the way he defended the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ said, today Jannah has become wajib on Talha because of how he defends me. Then we told, spoke of Khatada ibn al-Nu'man al-Awsi, uh, one of the arrows hit into his eye. Now, what happened was, while protecting the Prophet Wasallam, an arrow hit his eye, and the Prophet Wasallam made dua. What was the dua? So let his eye become the best eye, and let it be the most precise in eyesight. And this is exactly what happened. The only pagan who was to be killed by the Prophet Wasallam at the Battle of Ohad was Ubay ibn Khalaf, who had threatened him many times. Then we observed how the Prophet ﷺ was injured. And at one point of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanded the Prophet ﷺ for, for one of the statements that he had made. Because when injured, he said, how can a nation be successful when they have injured their own Prophet? Allah says, it is left to Allah, so as to whom he will forgive and who he will pardon. Then we spoke of Allah's divine wisdom in the injuries. Then we went to honoring the martyrs and the special status that was given to the martyrs who had memorized the Quran. Later, the Prophet ﷺ visited the families of the shuhada and spoke to them and gave his condolences. Can we start the next slide, please? We mentioned in the previous session that many of the women were crying and wailing and sh shouting out loud for the sake of the Sahaba who had passed away. It was at that time, the books of the Hadith mentioned that it, that was the day the Prophet ﷺ forgave, for, forbade the practice of wailing. That is, tearing the clothes, screaming and shouting, etc. He forbade that. Basically, crying, struggling, feeling the pain is all human. The Prophet ﷺ said, the heart grieves, it hurts, the eyes shed tears. That's what a human being does. So we have to be very careful not to go to the opposite extreme where all of a sudden you don't even allow the person to cry. When the mother is crying for her dead child, no, you should not cry, stay quiet, don't, don't do this, you should not shed tears, it's wrong. 
allow the human part of it to take over, but only thing not to scream, not to shout, and not to, trying to tear the clothes. The Prophet ﷺ said many nice things to them and then explained to them that the existing practice of shouting and uh, screaming has to, should not be continued. We now come to the Muslim women who help the wounded. It was uncommon for women to actually fight in wars, but they had a very important role in rallying the troops, boosting their morale with chants, not the singing and dancing like how the idolaters did, but in a very human and decent manner, quenching their thirst in times of extreme heat and ultimately serving as important helpers to those wounded in the battle. Generally speaking, the women did not participate in military expeditions. But this battle of Uhud and a couple of more battles was were different. In the case of Uhud, the, it was different because this place of battle was a walking distance from their houses, very close to Medina. And second, secondly, it was a need of the time and it was necessary for them to come forward and help the wounded Muslims. It is also mentioned that the women of Ansar played an active role in being nurses and giving water to the sick and the wounded on the battlefield. We are uh, talking of one, uh, one Muslima, Nusayba bin Kaab, Razalwatala Anha. She is also known as Umme Ammara, Umme Umara, and Umme Mara. She was a woman from Al Khazraj, one of the early women who converted to Islam. Her husband, Ghazia, and her two sons also took part in helping the wounded. Nusayba had been one of the women who had gone out with the 70 men from Medina to Makkah for the second pledge of Aqaba. She took part in the allegiance to the Prophet at that time. She later took part in the battles of Hunayn, Yamama, and the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Here at, this, uh, at the time of Ohad, she set off for the battlefield where she would at least be able to tend to the wounded and give drink to the thirsty. Even then, she took with her a sword, also a bow, and a quiver of arrows. So with all this in hand, she managed to ward off the blows with her shield, and she sustained at least 12 major wounds. Nusayba Rasulullah Anha was by far the most distinguished of women because of her many superior qualities, especially because of the bravery she demonstrated in defense of the Prophet ﷺ during the Battle of Uhud. She, along with her husband and sons, tried to surround the Prophet ﷺ in order to protect him. She withstood the pain of multiple wounds to ensure that no harm would come to the Prophet ﷺ. But even then, she did not complain, neither did she lose heart. She asked the Prophet ﷺ to make dua that she and her family would join him in paradise, in Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ made the dua. The life of uh, Nusayba is not uh, given in detail. What remains is authenticated and well-documented versions due to her participation in the key events in the life of the Prophet ﷺ and in the daily, the early days of Islam. The next uh, Sahabiya is Umm Sulaim, also known as Rumaisa Rajalotala Anha. When she accepted Islam, she was married to Malik bin Nadar. They were having consist, uh, constant quarrels between them because her husband did not approve of her reversion to Islam. They had a son named Anas. Her husband migrated to Syria ultimately where he was murdered. She later married Abu Talha after he converted to Islam. 
we learn that Aisha Razilatala and her and Umm Sulaim Razilatala and her were running around the battlefield helping the injured with water canisters, food, etc. They would then go back, fill them, and come back to continue with the same. Another is Umm Ayman bin Thalaba. I am sure you recall her. Her real name was Baraka bin Thalab. Ta'laba. She later became known as, known by her son's name as Umme Ayman. You will remember, she was the lady who played the role of mother and took care of the Prophet ﷺ when she was young. She was like a member of the family of the Prophet ﷺ. In the Battle of Ohad, she gave herself up completely to nursing the wounded and providing water to the thirsty Muslims in the battlefield. Uh, to know more about the great women of Islam, not only these, but many, many more women of Islam, you may download from the link that I'm, I have given there, inshallah. Uh, we will send you the link separately also, so it will become convenient for you. Yes, the link has been sent. You can just copy it from there and download the book. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, immediately after the Battle of Farhad, there was an expedition of Hamra al-Assad. What is the purpose of this? The purpose of this expedition was to make sure the idolaters don't launch another attack, that they don't come back again and fight with the Muslims. We learned that the idolaters, even though at the end, they knew that the Prophet ﷺ was alive. They still decided to regroup and return to Makkah. They had not achieved what they wanted to do. However, while going back, they began debating amongst themselves. What should be done? What should be done? Shall we go back to Madina and finish them off? Or should we just go back to Makkah? These things were debated. During this time, Naturally, the Prophet ﷺ was worried that this is exactly what they may do, that they may return and try to attack them at Madinah. So as soon as he got back to Madinah, he organized a group of those who participated in the Battle of Uhud. When others came to know of it, Abdullah ibn Ubay, the leader of the hypocrites, he volunteered. Can you just imagine? But the Prophet ﷺ refused. He did not want any of the 300 hypocrites to join this group. Ultimately, 70 of the Sahaba volunteered. At the head of them was Ali ibn Abi Talib, That was a Sunday, the 16th of Shawwal, one day after Uhud. The Prophet ﷺ told Ali to camp at Amra al-Asad. And that is why this expedition is called the expedition of Hamra al-Asad. The Prophet ﷺ told Ali Razalatala and who see in the distance what they are riding. If they are riding horses, they will come back to Madinah. But if they are riding their camels, they will go back to Makkah. The Sahaba found that the idolaters were riding their camels back to Makkah. The next day, the Prophet ﷺ joined the 70 Sahaba. Allah praised these people in the Quran. If you go to Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 172, the interpretation reads, those who answered Allah, that's the call of Allah, and the messenger, the Prophet ﷺ, after being wounded, for those of them who did good deeds and feared Allah, there is a great reward. The Prophet ﷺ camped at Hamra al-Asad for three days to make sure that the idolaters don't come back. Still, the idolaters began lamenting the fact that they didn't do what they wanted to, which is to kill the Prophet ﷺ. The main person in this was Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl. He said, we need to go back and get rid of this menace forever. Just at that time, Safwan ibn Umayyah 
who's one of the noblemen amongst them, was against the idea. He said, don't do this. For verily, they will be fuming in anger, and you don't know, maybe their groups of the Khazraj and Aus who did not participate will start participating now. This is where we come to the role of Ma'abad al Khuzai. Ikrimah continued to insist, neither have we killed Muhammad nor have we uh, earned the admiration of our young ladies. They were all about to be convinced until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a tactic against them in the form of a person by the name of Ma'abad ibn al khuzai Ma'abad happened to be in the area. He visited the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at Madina before the Prophet go, could go to the Hamra al-Asad. And he gave the Prophet special condolences. He said, we have heard what happened to you and your companions. Know that I am not pleased by this. I would rather the other group was inflicted with the loss and defeat. He left Madina and on the way back home, he met Abu Sufyan who recognized him immediately as being one of the noblemen of his tribe, the tribe of Khuzaa. Abu Sufyan was really happy because now they can find out the state of Madina. He asked them, he asked him, O oh, Ma'abad, tell me, how did you leave the Prophet ﷺ and his companions? Ma'abad was very sympathetic to the Muslims. Allah made him repeat exactly what Safwan had said before without even without him even knowing that he's repeating what Safwan said. So Abu Sufyan asked, what would you advise us to do? He said, I advise you to flee as fast as your horses will take you. When they saw someone as noble as Ma'abad look so terrified, this made them decide ultimately that they would go back. The Prophet ﷺ had no idea that this happened. And Ma'abad did this on his own accord. Now the question arises. Was the battle of Uhud a win or a loss for the Muslims? Let's look at this. Is Uhud a genuine loss or not? It's common to say it was a loss in terms of the number of people who died. The, in that way, the Muslims certainly lost. The idolaters lost about 22 of their men, whereas the Muslims were at least 70 martyrs. But then there are other ways to look at victory and loss. What was the goal of the Muslims? And uh, were they victorious in this? The goal was to defend Madina. Yes, they were victorious. What was the goal of the idolaters? Were they victorious in this? The goal was to obliterate the Muslims, to kill the Prophet ﷺ. They did not achieve it. They failed in all departments. They thought they would surprise the Muslims, but they failed. Now, who remained on the battlefield and who left after the battle? It was the Muslims who remained on the battlefield and it was the idolaters who went back. Were there any prisoners of war? The Muslims had one of the idolaters, but the idolaters did not have any prisoners of war. No Muslims got into their hands. The Mushrikun did not pursue the Muslims. Rather, it was the other way around. The Muslims started pursuing them. This shows that the Muslims had the upper hand post-battle. The Muslims remained there three days at Hamra al-Asad near Ohad, whereas the idolaters started moving back to Makkah. The issue of the trade route between Makkah and Syria continued to remain a problem for the, uh, for, uh, for the idolaters. It was not solved. So they, it had not been resolved. They thought they could get over it by defeating the Muslims. Now, if you would ask the idolaters, they themselves would not consider the Battle of Ahad as a victory. 
So this clearly demonstrates that the battle of Ahad for Muslims was not actually a pure victory, but it was not a loss also. The Muslims did not achieve the kind of victory that they were expecting, but the idolaters most certainly did not gain even a fraction of what they wanted. Next slide, please. Now we'll do an analysis. Why are we going to do the analysis? The Battle of Badr was the first battle that was ever fought by the Muslims. And the Battle of Ohad was also another decisive war. What are the lessons that we derive from this and what was the wisdom behind all that happened? Please remember, whatever we learn from the surah, please don't think it is something of the past. No. It is something that applies today and it is something that will, will apply till the akhirah. It is the seerah of the Prophet Please don't just think it happened in the past, so why should we get to know about it? Now, the first thing I would like to say is, the first wisdom is tamyiz, which means separation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to separate the filthy from the pure. Let's just compare the Battle of Ahad with the Battle of Badr, basically. If we go to Battle of Badr, you go to Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah 37, the interpretation reads, in order that Allah may distinguish the wicked, filthy, from the good, pure, and put the wicked one on another, heap them together, and cast them into hell. Those, it is they who are the losers. Now here, who is this filthy? Naturally, it was the mushriks. Who is the pure? The Muslims. Now, let's go to the Battle of Ohad. You go to Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 179. You recall when the hypocrites left the place. The interpretation of part of the ayah reads, he distinguishes the wicked from the good. And then later Allah says in the same ayah, and if you believe and fear Allah, then for you there is a great reward. Uhud has the same wisdom as Badr, but the people that are dirty, khabith, are different. The khabith in Badr were the mushrikun. The khabith in Uhud were the munafiqin. Just see how it turns out. One of the biggest benefits of Ahad is that the Muslims truly understood the real and evil nature of hypocrisy. Now, in the Battle of Badr, you will recall there was the promise of Allah. In Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 7, the interpretation reads, and remember when Allah promised you, that's the Muslims, one of the two parties of the enemy, either the caravan or the army of the Quraysh, that it should be yours. You wish that the one not armed should be yours. But Allah willed to justify the truth by his words and to cut off the roots of the disbelievers. Basically, you will recall that the Muslims were to go and attack the caravan. But Allah willed, even though they gave them a choice, Allah willed that they would go and attack the army. In contrast, let us look at Ohad. In Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah 167, the interpretation reads, and that he might test the hypocrites. See here. Here the attention is drawn to the hypocrites. Then the ayah continues, they were that day nearer to disbelief than to iman faith, saying with their mouths what was not in their hearts. But Allah has full knowledge of what they conceal. This is what the hypocrites do. They conceal the truth. And this was exactly what Abdullah ibn Ubay said when he retreated from the battle of Ohad. And then again, another lesson, Allah's help through unity and sincerity. Because through disunity and disobedience, Allah will take away the help that he used to give. 
So unity and sincerity are very important here. With regards to the Battle of Badr, if you go to Surah Al-Anfal, say Surah number 8, Ayah number 43, with the interpretation reads, and remember, when Allah showed them to you as few in your dream, if he had to show them as many, you would surely have been discouraged and you would have surely have disputed in making a decision. But Allah saved you. Certainly, he is the all-knower of what is in the press. Now, how about to her? The exact opposite. You go to Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 152. We have done this before. And Allah it did indeed fulfill his promise to you when you were killing them, that's your enemy, with his permission until the moment you lost your courage and fell to disputing about the order and disobeyed after he showed you the booty, something which you love. Among you are some that desire this world and some that desire the hereafter. Then he made you flee from your enemy, that he might test you. But surely he forgave you. And Allah is most gracious to the believers. Subhanallah. Look at how much this one ayah contains. How much we can learn from that. If you go to Surah Muhammad, Surah number 47, ayah number 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O oh, you who believe, if you help in the cause of Allah, he will help you and make your foothold firm. Now contrast this with the Sahaba, what the Sahaba said at Badr versus what the Munafiqun said at Ohr. What did Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad who say at Badr? He said, by Allah, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if you charge into the ocean, we are going to be right behind you. Compared to this, what did Abdullah ibn Ubay say? He said, why should we listen to him when he did not listen to us? And he took away 300 of his people out of the thousand that had marched towards Ahad. Additionally, even though at Badr the Sahaba were unarmed and defenseless, they were willing to fight. But at Ohad, even though they were fully armed, they were swayed by the booty that they saw, the spoils of war. From this, we clearly see what happens when one is sincere to Allah and obeys Allah, which is the Battle of Badr. Versus one who disobeys and is not sincere to Allah and his messenger as found in the battle of Ohad. Next is Allah chooses. He knows who he will guide and who he will not guide. Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 128, the interpretation reads, not for you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the decision whether he turns, whether Allah turns in mercy to pardon them or punishing them. Verily, they are the Zalimun, the polytheists. And amazingly, you will find later, every senior leader of the idolaters at the Battle of Ahad eventually were guided to Islam. Abu Sufyan, Ikrima, Khalid bin al -Irlid, Safwan ibn Umayya, etc. And just imagine the very person who launched the counter offensive, that's Khalid ibn al Walid, he got the title of Saifullah, the sword of Allah. Compare this to the Battle of Badr. All the filthy leaders were not worthy of Iman, they died. Can we have the next slide, please? Next is very, very important. Victory is not granted, nor is it guaranteed just because you are a good Muslim. It applies today, it applies till the Akhirah. Victory has to be struggled for. There's no exception at all. No one's rank is raised in this world or in the next, except through the testing by Allah. 
their patience, their tolerating the pain and the suffering that they go through. Now, even the Prophet ﷺ needs to be wounded to demonstrate to us that every single human being, no matter how perfect they might be, still need to go through the trials and tribulations. The next point is, we learn that our Prophet ﷺ was a normal human being. He bled same way that we bleed also. If you go to Ali Imran, Surah, Surah number 3, Ayah 144, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is no more than a messenger and indeed many messengers have passed away before him. If he dies or is killed, will you then turn back on your heels like the disbelievers? Now, the next point. The primary benefit we learn from this incident of Ahad is that there were two causes for humiliation. What were they? One was isyan, which is disobedience, disobeying Allah and his messenger. The next cause was hubbud dunya, the love of the dunya. To turn to this world and give it more importance than the akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very clearly in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah 152. We had done this ayah before, so I'll just go briefly into this. And Allah did indeed fulfill his promise to you when you were killing your enemy with his permission until the moment you lost courage and fell to disputing about the order. This is when they started giving importance to the booty, the spoils of war. Again, the Prophet ﷺ made a very special dua for the dead of Uqbah. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Uqbah ibn Amir who says that eight years after the battle of Uhud, can you imagine? Eight years after the battle of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ made a special dua for the dead of Uhud as if he was bidding them farewell. It was a very emotional dua. He stood on the member. At that time, the Prophet ﷺ was sick. It was about the last week of his life. And he said, I will be the one who will be waiting for you at the fountain. I will testify in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding you. Meet me at the fountain. And then he said, I'm not worried that you will fall into shirk. I'm worried that after I die, this dunya will open up for you and you will compete with one another to try to get the most of it. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. You have Uhud and now you have the dunya and the competition for the dunya. In the very last sermon, he was still thinking about the shuhada of Uhud and the lesson of Uhud, which was loving the dunya too much. And this is exactly what is happening in our time also. The love of the dunya. People love the dunya too much. Can we go to the next slide, please? A question arises, why were the Sahaba of Badr considered as the best Sahaba amongst all the Sahaba? They fought in the first of, uh, first of Ramadan, first month of Ramadan of the Muslims, which was declared at that time. One of the reasons. Surah Ali Imran, again, Surah number 3, Ayah number 123. And Allah has already made you victorious at Badr when you were a weak little force. So fear Allah much. Keep away from sins and all evil deeds. And love Allah much. Perform all kinds of good deeds which he has ordained so that you may be grateful. The best Sahaba amongst all the Sahaba were the Sahaba of Badr and the best of angels, as Jibreel Islam mentioned, were the angels who fought on the day of Badr. This was the first battle, though it was not planned. 
The Muslims didn't want to fight, basically. Allah said, fighting was prescribed for you, and this was the first battle they had to fight. Some of them actually did not want to fight at that time. If you go through Suratul Anfal, you'll find it very rich with brothers. Very, very detailed about some of the personal circumstances in terms of the seerah. What happened before the battle, what happened during the battle, and after the battle, how things would be distributed. It also gives us a window into the dua of the Prophet ﷺ and into the hearts of the companions as they were preparing themselves for the battle. I would like to recall again, we have done this before, but still, the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. The night before Badr, the Prophet ﷺ was not thinking of defeat in the material sense or even with the intention of leaving a legacy of the battle. He raised his hands to Allah, calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, I am imploring you for what you had promised me. If this group of people are killed, and you, then you will not be worshipped on this earth. He continued to pray with his hands raised until his cloak fell off his shoulders. You can imagine how his hands were up towards the sky. Abu Bakr Razalwatala and who picked up the cloak, came behind the Prophet, put the cloak back on him, and said, We know that Allah will surely fulfill his promise to you. And Allah responded, Surah Al Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 9. Remember, when you sought help of your Lord, and he answered you saying, I will help you with a thousand of angels, each behind the other, in succession. Just observe the words here. Allah first sent a thousand angels. He increased them with a thousand angels behind them. Then increased them with another thousand angels behind them. Then Allah sent another two thousand angels until the total number of angels become 5,000 that came to fight alongside the believers. The angels only fought in Badr. And the believers saw the help of the angels coming to them. The angels were always present at all times to protect the, protect the Prophet ﷺ. But in the battle of Badr, they fought alongside the believers. And also recall when drowsiness came upon the Muslims just before the Battle of Badr. Another episode of the Seerah. This has to be considered as another of the favors of Badr. Al-Anfal, Surah 8, Ayah 11. The interpretation reads, When he covered you with a slumber as a security from him, he caused water to descend to clean you thereby to remove from you the writs of the shaitan and to strengthen your hearts and to make your feet firm. Subhanallah. Imagine having tranquility before the battle, even though they were outnumbered and the believers didn't even have animals or the weapons for the war. Allah sent upon them rain. They were in a higher place. This rain purified them removed them from them all the evil uh, hamazat of the shayateen and also strengthened their hearts and the legs were very firm on the ground. The same rain fell on the enemies who were on the lower side of the valley and completely messed them up. They were in a very unfavorable position. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you killed them not, but Allah killed them. Jibreel alayhi salam told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, pick up some dirt from the ground, throw it in the direction of the enemy. Every single person from the opposing side was struck in their eyes, whether they were near or far off. This is another reinforcement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unity, sincerity. Again, if you go to surah number 8, Al-Anfal, ayah number 17, you kill them not, but Allah killed them. And you, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, threw not when you did throw, but Allah threw. 
that he might test the believers by a fair trial from him. Verily, Allah is all hearer, all knower. Again, Allah says, when you were free, few and were reckoned weak in the land. Yes, they were few. They were very weak. They were oppressed. You feared the, that the people would get rid of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided you with refuge. He strengthened you with his help. He provided you with the sustenance of all that is good so that you may be amongst the grateful. Again, look here. The quality, the, we have to learn to be grateful to Allah at all times. If you go to Surah Al-Anfal again, uh, Surah number 8, Ayah number 26, the interpretation reads, and remember when you were few and were reckoned weak in the land and were afraid that men might kidnap you, but he provided you a safe place, strengthened you with his help and provided you with all the good things that you might be grateful. This message is not only for the Sahaba, but all the Muslims, who, when you look back, how many times was Islam supposed to end? Even today we see that. How many times did the Prophet ﷺ find himself and the Sahaba outnumbered? They were surrounded and seemed like all of them were going to be massacred. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a way out for them. He will make a way out for us also. Please don't lose hope in that. Success came to the Sahaba from the type of hearts they had. Please observe this. It was with this that they covered the rest of their journey on this earth as the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. It was their hearts that mattered. Let's go to the next slide, please. The message that we have for the Ummah. The message to the Ummah from the Prophet ﷺ is when our hearts are in the right place and our direction is unified and it is sourced from the Messenger ﷺ, moving forward with the conviction that Allah will always give us victory. Tawakkal Allah. On these conditions, Allah will support us no matter what the circumstances are. Now, what happened at that time that the Quran had to intervene? This Surah Anfal was revealed because something happened at that time. The Quran had to intervene. That means an ayah had to come. It, was, it had nothing to do in the battle. It was after the battle, after the uh, things were good, after the victory, and after they were having all that they loved. Now that the spoils of war were there, there began discussions and disputes as to who will get how much from the spoils of war. Then what did the Quran intervene? The first ayah of Surah Al-Anfal. They ask you, O Muhammad wasalam, about the spoils of war. Say, the spoils are for Allah and his messenger. So stop disputing. Fear Allah and adjust all matters of difference amongst you. Obey Allah and his messenger if you are believers. That applied at that time, that applies today, it applies till the Akhirah. It's a big lesson for us. There's something interesting I want to mention here. In this Suratul Anfal, the word Anfal is used. Whereas spoils of war, the name is Ghanima. In other surahs where war is mentioned, the word ghanima is used. For example, if you go to Surah Al-Fatha, Surah number 48, Ayah number 15, those who lag behind will say, when you set forth to take the ghanima, allow us to follow you. They want to change Allah's words. So here, the word ghanima is used and not anfal. What is the difference between these two? In Surah Anfal, it was not actually Ghanima, spoils of war. But because they obeyed Allah and the Prophet ﷺ, they left the caravan and they took part in this war, Allah says he gave them something extra. 
the Muslims were about to attack the caravan, which contained lots of material. But Allah mentions that here the spoils of war are something extra. It is something more than the spoils of war, which Allah terms as anfal. It got resolved how obey Allah and the Rasul. It is going to start and stop with the Prophet Sallallahu What does it say? That is the discipline that they abide by and in that they will find justice and goodness from the Prophet Sallallahu The Sahaba said, when we saw the war booty, we started disputing. Each mentioning their special role in the battle and our manners regarding the dispute was not at par. Just listen to what they said. Our manners were not at par. It was not that they disputed, but they were not in the best of manners. It was then that this ayah was revealed. Everything belongs to Allah and his messenger. It was rect about rectifying the manners of the people first in regards to what Allah had given. So Allah is working on their hearts before answering their question. So what does Allah do? He takes back everything. He takes back the spoils of the world. He takes everything. And later on, in ayah number 41 of the same surah, then the rules of distribution are mentioned. Just subhanallah, look at how the ayahs are placed in the Quran. Later in the same surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I know that whatever of war beauty that you may gain, verily one-fifth of it is assigned to Allah and to the messenger and to the near relatives of the messenger, etc., etc. The details are given. I'll just give you a small example of that. It may not be exactly the same, but just to give you an idea, supposing the father comes home and brings a few chocolates for his children. What will the children do? They will run around and they'll start fighting with each other, each one wanting more share. And the father, when he looks at them fighting around for these ch chocolates, what does he do? He takes back all the chocolate. And then after explaining to them, after telling them what is required, that they have to take care of their manners, they cannot do these things, ultimately he distributes them in the best and deserving manner. We'll come to that as we proceed now. When we go to the next slide. Go to the next slide, please. The question arises, why was the Battle of Ohad nearly lost? The reason was 40 archers dis disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ and they came down. Why did they come down? They were sure that the Muslims were victorious and they were worried that they would not get their share of the spoils of the war. Isn't this a truly a dunyavi comp comparison? A worldly and material? Isn't this the one that motivated these people to come down from the mountain? Now here the question is, what is the chocolate in our lives that causes us to neglect our manners and causes us to uh, do not to respect the rights of the others? We see that it starts from the heart. The Prophet ﷺ, you will recall that famous hadith that in our body there is a piece of flesh which is the heart. If that heart is okay, then our body is okay. If the heart is bad, the entire body is bad. Again, how wonderful in Surah Al-Takathur, al hakum al takathur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you people are diverted by gathering the tangible things in abundance. You want things from the dunya. Allah has given this only for you, for, as a test for you. How are you going to use it is what Allah wants to see. Whereas you're totally involved in the dunya, getting the materials. Are you going to look at it as a sign of Allah and use it in a way that is good? Or... Or do you want to control it? Do you want to steal it? If you have it and don't give it for those in need, it leads to having bad manners, not acting in the way that is consistent with Islam. 
Like Allah is asking, is it material that you are fighting over? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded them, saying that you are the believers. You took shahada. I helped you with angels. Look at what Allah gave you. And at the end of the day, now you're going to fight over this, which is nothing. Remember, we are the people of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. How can we fight with each other at home, at office, the masajid, amongst friends, amongst relatives? How can we fight over them, the material things of the world? And when we do so, Allah takes it. Only to teach us a lesson, and when we rectify ourselves, he gives it back to us. Allah has given the dunya to us in our hands. Please don't take it to your hearts. And then remember, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his terms and not on ours. The Sahaba are beyond our scope. They are our startups. There are ranks among the Sahaba and the people of Badr are the greatest of the Sahaba. In the revelation, even though the degree of admonishment is only to the extent of what they had done, the way the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ handled the Sahaba at those times always shows that there's always a path back for them to come. It just doesn't shrug them off or throw them out. Same with us. All those who were around the Prophet ﷺ were giving many, many chances to either expiate or elevate. What did the companions do? They chose to elevate themselves in the eyes of the Allah and the Prophet ﷺ. This is a very big lesson for me and for all of us. It was not the hypocrites that fled the, uh, fled the battle of Badr. They were turned back even before the start of Ohad. This is what the hypocrites did. There's an interesting incident of Saad ibn Malik's request to the Prophet ﷺ. The hadith related to him after the battle of Badr, he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, it suits my heart very finally. We saw ourselves being oppressed many times and today we are victorious. He requested the Prophet ﷺ, please grant me the sword from the spoils of the war. The Prophet ﷺ said, the sword belongs neither to you or to me. Leave it right there. He said, I put the sword aside and moved away. And as I did this, a thought came to my head. Perhaps he's going to give it to someone else who didn't fight as hard as I did. Can you imagine what thought came into his mind? All of a sudden, someone called him from behind saying, the Prophet ﷺ is calling you back. He said, I told myself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has probably revealed something regarding me just because I thought in that manner. I must have made a mistake in the way I thought. But an ayah of Surah Al-Anfal is revealed. The Prophet calls him and he says, I commanded you to put the sword here when it was neither mine nor yours. But now, after the ruling is given, and I have one-fifth of the spoils, this sword belongs to me. You can take the sword now. Take it back. SubhanAllah. When we respond to Allah and His Messenger, وسلم, when we are willing to obey, even when we find that something is in my chest, which we may not like, there is always the best for us when we respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger Next slide, please. Remember the choice given to the Muslims before the Battle of Badr. I'm repeating this again to give you the importance of it. They were not supposed to go and fight the Mushrikeen. It was supposed to be a raid on a caravan. It was very easy. But on the way, things changed. And they had one of the two situations. The caravan, which was easy, or going back to going for the battle of Badr and facing an army three times their size. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them again when, I, when we go to the ayah number seven of Surat Al-Anfal. And remember when Allah promised you one of the two parties, you wished that the one not armed should be yours. You wanted something which was easy. But Allah will to justify the truth by his words and cut off the roots of the disbelievers. You wanted something which was easy, but Allah wanted something different for you. How? Inside of you, you wanted everything to be easy. In fact, even today, we ought, whatever we want to do, we always want to find the easy way out. Just imagine. You were promised one of both will be yours. Now, the question is, what would have happened if Allah had granted them the easy option? No, Allah wanted something else. Allah wanted them to face the army. He wanted to give them more than the caravan. He wanted to make them the people of Badr, to make them the people of Haq. And this Haq is going to show through their hands. So Allah wants to grant the Sahaba the favor to show them all the miracles that will be of ahl badr Imagine Allah's help, the angels participating, 5,000 angels. Why? Because they complied and went with it. Even though in the beginning, from inside it was difficult. Look at what ultimately happened. Not only did Allah give them the spoils, they became the ahl badr They became the role models. They were the top in the ranks of the companions of Badr. So high. Sometimes similar things happen to us. We want to be peaceful. We want to have everything ready, uh, easy. Or even when you do dawa, it should be peaceful. We should not get into any problems, etc., etc. Always asking for ease. But sometimes there is a path that is difficult, which we don't want. But this, we must ask ourselves, will we be the generation that Allah will choose to bring haq and proof on our hands? Will we be the generation that changes the world's view of Islam and who Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is? It requires courage. There are those who will oppose it. Will we comply? Will we say samayna wa taana? We hear and we obey. Will we take it up? Allah subhanahu wa taala says in Surah Al-Anfal, ayah number twenty-four. Oh, you believe, answer Allah. That's by obeying him and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when they call you to that which will give you life. And know that Allah comes in between a person and his heart. And verily, to him you shall be gathered. Whether you like it or not, whether we like it or not, we have to get back to Allah. How we get back to him is what matters. Allah is inviting you to that which will bring you life. And again, remember, Allah will respond to your dua, no doubt about it. But then, do I ask myself, how am I responding to Allah? Have you ever asked that question? Next slide, please. I want Allah to respond to me, but have I responded to Allah? I may call on him when I need something. In fact, he, he wants us to do that. He encourages us. He demands us to make dua. But then, how are we responding to the message that he has given us? How are we responding to the lessons that we get the, from the Prophet Wasallam, our role model? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, please respond I always want to give you that which is good. May Allah make us like the companions of Badr who say, Sami'ana wa ata'ana. We listen and we obey. Ameen. May Allah make us the generation which will show the world what Islam is and who the Prophet is. Ameen. 
There are people who look at the Prophet وسلم, and they don't see his beauty. They don't see his character. Our behavior, our character is not reflecting what the Prophet وسلم, what our role model is. The people of Badr had a great bounty that Allah gave them. They were forgiven for their past and future sins. Imagine being alive still in the early days of Islam and being told that you are forgiven for all your past and your future sins as well. What they do even after that, Allah says, I have already pardoned you. Can you imagine how would we react to such a, uh, such a commitment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do you know how these people live the rest of their lives? These Ahl al-Badr, people of Badr, they live their remaining lives in shukr and gratitude. All of them later on live to become the veterans of every other battle and they, that they live to see and they continue to serve alongside the Prophet ﷺ. They continue to be the most loyal supporters of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah guide and help us to keep him only, only him in our hearts and keep the dunya in our hands. Ameen, Ya Rabbi. Inshallah, in the next session, we will refer to the Ghazwa al-Raji and what happens after the battle of Uhud. We'll start with the duas. Allahumma zayyinna bi zinat al-Iman waj'alna Udatam Muhtadeen. Allahumma inna nas'aluka min al khairi kullihi ajilihi wa ajilihi ma alimna minhu wa ma alam na alam. Wa na'uzu bika min al sharri kullihi ajilihi wa ajilihi ma alimna minhu wa ma alam na alam. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-jannatu al-firdawsi wa ma qarraba ilayha min khawlim wa amal. Wa na'uzu bika min al-nari wa ma qarraba ilayha min khawlim wa amal. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.